This is the Dragon King, His Majesty, Jigme Singye Wang Chu. These are two of his four royal wives, all sisters. These are his loyal subjects. Welcome to the last Shangri-La. In a world where increasingly being modern means being the same, where you cannot necessarily tell by the streetscape what country you are in, it's refreshing to come to the mystical kingdom of Bhutan. This has not been the fastest country on earth to modernize. It wants to take it slowly, to learn by others' mistakes. Ours, that is. Take traffic, for example. Timfu is now the only capital city in the world with no traffic lights. They did have a set installed a few years ago, but people complained that they were unsightly. So they were taken down, and the traffic policemen returned. And why not? I've never seen a set of traffic lights enjoying themselves as much as this man. Bhutan does, of course, have its traffic jams. But even these have their own individualistic style. And there seems to be a total absence of road rage. Such is life in an undeveloped country. When people talked about development in the past, they always asked what the gross national product was. And the king then turned around and said, we're not interested in gross national product. We are interested in gross national happiness. And what the king says goes. While the rest of the world was plunging with economic rationalist fervor towards a new millennium, this king took a bizarre step and opted for the well-being of his subjects. To us, gross national happiness basically means that ultimately the long-term and the ultimate goal of development should be happiness, that the people should be happy. And Bhutan uh, believes that this happiness cannot come from purely material uh, development, economic development, but that it must be very carefully balanced with uh, spiritual health, with the environment, and generally the quality of life. One might be tempted to think that the gross national happiness here is drug-induced. After all, the streets are paved not with gold, but with marijuana. From every nook and cranny, in every street, cannabis grows like a weed. But virtually no one smokes it. Instead, they feed it to the animals. This farmer told me his cows didn't like it much, but the pigs were hooked. While the pigs can't just say no to drugs, it seems the Bhutanese can. Yes, marijuana grows wild all over. It's more common than normal grass. And I think it reflects the innocence of Bhutanese society that it's not used as a drug. You know that marijuana is the most popular food for pigs. People go around, you'll find, uh, you walk around every, any time of the day, you'll find people collecting it to feed their pigs. I think Bhutan is one country where pigs do fly. <laughs> But here, high in the Himalayas, halfway to heaven, something is afoot. Important people are in town. There's magic in the air. Just days away are the biggest celebrations here for 25 years. It's the Silver Jubilee. The Dragon King has been on the throne for a quarter of a century. The whole city is rehearsing. 
bristling with anticipation. For on this coming royal day of days, there can be no mistakes. Everything must run smoothly. Not that the king is a beheading king, just the opposite. Indeed, he seems to be honestly and universally admired. Yeah, he's a good, good king. During the king's reign, life expectancy has increased an astounding 20 years. Figures on education, health, clean water supply, electricity, all are just as impressive. The government has paid for the improvements with hydroelectricity, which it sells to India just down the mountains. The second biggest money spinner is tourism. To get a glimpse of heaven, tourists pay top dollar. There's no tourist quota, but the government charges a minimum 250 US dollars a day to keep the numbers down. The main tourist attraction is the wilderness. In these Himalayan foothills, there's a cornucopia of diversity, a treasure house of the world's plant and animal species. And the government is well aware of its value. This is Her Majesty, Ashi Dorji Wangmo Wangchuk, the queen, well, one of the queens. She's guest of honor here at this tree planting ceremony. But it's not just a government paying lip service while tearing the forests apart. Bhutan's record with its ecology is exemplary. Even the greenies agree. Uh, the king, right from the start, I think, was most uh, conscious of the need to preserve the Bhutanese, uh, well, let's just take it simply, the forest, the forest cover. And uh, from the very beginning, he uh, introduced a ban on logging by private uh, companies, which were there when he took over. Bhutan is the only country in the region that can boast an increase in forest cover over the past 25 years. Even on a day-to-day -day basis, the environment gets a look-in. The king recently banned plastic bags in the kingdom. He even uh, issued a royal decree whereby, you know, even the king himself, who, according to a law, is usually above the law, has to obtain a permit to be able to get a tree for his own use. It comes as no surprise that the motivating factor in the king's philosophy has a spiritual rather than material ethic. The landscape and the culture uh, go hand in hand. And uh, the culture, which is basically based on Buddhism, again, is, uh, is very uh, benign to the environment. And uh, we believe in not harming any uh, living being and not harming anything, uh, not only human beings. Buddhism is the driving force of Bhutan, the strongest of all their traditions. Traditions that have remained protected by the remoteness of the Himalayas. Many hundred years it has been uh, in that tradition. But uh, I don't say that, uh, you know, we have to continue this tradition, you know, they're exactly the same. Bhutan has recognized that change is now inevitable, that their geographic isolation will no longer protect them from outside forces. <laughs> During the king's reign, tradition has been encouraged. 
At this government-run school in Timfu, the best young craftsmen and women from around the country receive expert tuition. The skills being learnt here are ancient, steeped in Buddhist mythology. But increasingly, these artefacts are valued not just for their use in Buddhist ritual, but as products that can be sold to the growing tourist market. The culture is changing, but to Buddhists, nothing remains the same. Tradition or culture, whatever doesn't matter, but main thing is the people's intellectual way, their development, intellectual development is important. So I think so far, within these 25 years, at the Bhutanese people, intellectually, there's a lot of development, I can say. But some developments just about to happen could test Buddhist patience to the limit. High above the city, preparations are being made. A new deity is about to arrive. Television is coming to Bhutan. And that's not all. Because of the action we take today, there will be profound impact on our society. Internet will have wide application in organizations and our personal lives. In this jubilee year, everything seems to be happening at once. Not only is television coming, the internet has arrived. Bhutanese will now be able to surf the superhighway. The choice of content on internet is indeed vast. What is downloaded and how internet is used is up to the prudence of the users. Like all tools, on one hand, it is very powerful. On the other hand, it can be put to detrimental use and overwhelm the users. With yet another official opening in this week of ceremonies, Bhutanese home life is changed forever. Television finally arrives. Television will become a very important force for national integration, for the promotion of Bhutanese culture including music and literary activities. But some remain dubious on the impact it will have. I think there will be the whole consumerism culture, the, the impact of the very, very, uh, very aggressive advertising which is on television. And I think, uh, I mean, that's why it was, uh, because it's all going to be new to Bhutan, it's all going to be very attractive, very glittering, very, uh, very bright. I think it's going to be, it's, uh, it's going to be a problem. Night one, and the good people of Tim Fu sit down expectantly to spend their first evening in front of the telly. <laughs> Buddhists believe that all of life is an illusion. One monk pointed out that television must therefore be an illusion of an illusion. And if something is so unreal, perhaps it is not so dangerous. Anyway, uh, all is the illusion, is it? Anyway. So therefore, if you understand the nature of the that illusion or realize the that illusion, so television is nothing. And so in the kingdom of Bhutan arrives the royal day of days. In other parts of the world, royalty is in trouble. Here, the fairy story just gets stronger. Far from clinging to power, this young king last year shocked the parliament by introducing new legislation devolving his power to his subjects. In effect, parliament, by a vote of no confidence, could now sack him. But nobody wants to. They want him to continue developing this tiny kingdom while maintaining the country's unique identity. 
It's an identity that they are pleading with the world to leave intact. I think Bhutan is looking at global trends, seeing the so-called globalization and especially mourning perhaps the disappearance of many diverse cultures. In that sense, Bhutan really believes that the world needs Bhutan. Perhaps the real question is, does Bhutan need the rest of the world? Yet another first, a Ferris wheel. It's taken a while to get here, but the Bhutanese respond with an innocent passion that Coney Island and Luna Park lost long ago. As they whirl into a new technological orbit, renouncing the isolation of their ancient hermit kingdom, you could only wish them well. Including this culture, music and literary activity. <laughs>